Hello and welcome. My name is Jim Brown. I'm chair of vocal studies here at Pacific Lutheran University. And we are so fortunate to have Lawrence Brownlee with us, who is one of the great singers of the world and uh, certainly one of the great tenors this country has produced. And I want to read a couple of his, um, uh, his uh, accolades so that those of you who are either hiding under a rock or, or you know, if you haven't, um, haven't uh, heard him sing, you're in for a treat. We're going to listen to a little bit tonight, actually. But uh, from his bio, American-born tenor Lawrence Brownlee captivates audiences and critics around the world and has been hailed as, quote, an international star in the bel canto operatic repertory. That's the New York Times. Uh, he has performed at the Metropolitan Opera, uh, in all over all of the major opera houses of the world, uh, all of the major symphony orchestras, and uh, of course, all of the uh, with all of the great conductors. So, uh, without any further delay, I want to bring him right on. And uh, Lawrence Brownlee, thank you for being with us. Hello, Jim. It's nice to be with you today. Great, Larry. We're so thrilled and. Um, we're going to be joined a little later by my colleague, Dr. Soon Cho, and uh, Soon was so kind to, to arrange for this. I know you all go way back, and so we will benefit by uh, her taking advantage of your friendship and ha having you with us today. Uh, where are you, where are you uh, tonight? Where are you calling from? I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm actually working at Opera Philadelphia. I am the festival artist for uh, their online festival that they're doing. And so I've been doing some recording last week and this week. So that's why I'm in Philadelphia. Fantastic. Well, they're lucky to have you there. Um, let me just for a moment share my screen again. And uh, I, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't talk about the wonderful Ruth Bader Ginsburg that, that we uh, have recently lost on Friday, this last Friday. And I know you were friends with her and uh, she was a great advocate for opera and, uh, and a huge opera fan and one of probably one of the most knowledgeable opera fans out there. And uh, this is from, of course, The Daughter of the Regiment where she had a cameo, I guess, in, in a dialogue role in that, in that opera. Uh, tell us a little bit about your friendship uh, with her and, um, and what she meant to you and what she meant to opera in general. Well, our friendship began probably about 10 years ago. I was singing at the Washington Concert Opera, and I remember her and Justice Scalia coming back. And uh, at that time, of course, I knew, she, I knew who she was and I knew her of her work, but she was so understated and she blended in that a friend of mine, she said, can you believe we met Ruth Bader Ginsburg? I said, I didn't meet Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And she said, yes, you did. And so I said, no, I did not. And so she said, look at the picture on my page, and you'll see that you have your arm around her. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I did meet her. But she was so, I mean, you really wouldn't know it because it was, she was the most humble, and she was a person, and she was the type of person that was all about you. She wasn't about herself. And so she loved music. She raved about the performance. And subsequently, I began to see her in many other places, and I really got the chance to know her when she invited me to the Supreme Court, she curated a musicale that she had uh, several singers that have come, you know, almost every year. And so I was invited to do that. She invited me personally. So uh, part of the, um, the big deal about that is that I got a chance to sit next to her for dinner. And that's when we began to talk about music. We talked about politics. We talked about my life. She was so interested in my voyage and, you know, my journey as far as like how I started with music. And from that time, on. She's just been really, really kind, you know, and she's inquired about me and I've gotten a chance to spend time with her and meet with her. And so over the years, and so last year was the last time I got a chance to meet, uh, see her. And I remember saying to her, you know, I'm just so happy that you're here at the performance. How are you doing? And this was just after her latest cancer surgery. And she said to me, she said, um, you know, it's really hard to keep coming back from cancer, but I'm going to try to hold on as long as I can. And so... Uh, we hugged, we embraced, and, uh, you know, I didn't know that that would be the last time, but I'm glad that I got a chance to spend a little bit more time with her. But she's someone uh, that I did consider a friend, and I am really sorry about her loss. Yeah, yeah, we will all, of course, 
miss her voice on the court, uh, especially, and um, and she was a voice of uh, obviously for for women, but but also for all all social justice, and I, mm -hmm. I think. She would be uh, thrilled to know that we are here today to talk about some difficult things. And um, we're here to celebrate your career. Uh, and again, for people who may not know your singing uh, and may not be opera aficionados, and uh, I do want to, to talk a little bit about that, about your singing. And I've been a fan for a long time, and so this is a real thrill for me just to sit down and talk to you for a few minutes. Um, I, I have a story to tell, and uh, this goes back, I don't know, you were singing Arturo with Seattle Opera. Uh, I don't know when that would have been, eight or ten years ago or something. I think and that was 2008, so 12 years ago, I think it 12 was. years ago, okay, well, that time flies. <laughs> <laughs> it may but, be, it, it could be ten, but yes. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, I was sitting in the audience with an old friend of yours, Shelby Rhodes, and <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah. And so Shelby and I were sitting and I mean, we were in the nosebleeds in McCall Hall, the second to last row up in the top balcony. And your voice sounded like it was right next to me the whole time. Oh, wow. I mean, wow. really, I, and, and I'm telling you that as, a, as another tenor, I, I just want to give you all respect for singing what what is for i think for many tenors a role that w could, could be comparable to like queen of the night that sort of thing and as far as the range challenges of that and and you sang that high f in the credasi and it was like it was like another just another note in your voice you know and i'm serious and, and i don't mean to embarrass you but but i i really just want to have a fanboy moment and tell you what what an incredible performance that was and uh and what a fan i am so well, uh, you know, that, that role is one of my favorites. Um, you know, you think there are some roles that you feel like really suit your voice well. Uh, it is a bear. It's not a walk in the park. Uh, as you know, being a tenor, I don't know if you sung that role or have sung no. parts of that role. It's uh, one of those I've things worked, that... I've worked on Ate Okada, but that's the only thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell people that I have to wear my shoes one size too small in order to be able to sing all those high notes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it, you just, you have to sing it with your voice and, uh, you know, I've sung it many times. I've sung it at the Met, I've sung it many times in Europe as well. And, uh, you know, I hope, it, hope to get the chance to sing it again, but it is one of those, those things that you have to bring your, you have to bring your big boy shoes to sing that role. And so mm -hmm. I'm happy that you appreciated what I did. And uh, hopefully since then I've matured in the role and hopefully sing it better than I did then and I've made some improvements, but uh, I appreciate you saying that. Well, I, I really do mean it. And for our audience, as I promised, I have a little taste now. I have to, I'll have this is a little bumpy, so sorry, I have to share my screen again. And this time with sound, um, and there's that wonderful picture. Um, but I'm going to go to, I have some clips here. The first one, first one is from your uh, wonderful concert you produced for the uh, Ryan Opera Center at Lyric Opera of Chicago. Uh, and it was a spotlight on all black singers and uh, all the singers on the program were, were, were black singers and unbelievable voices all. And, um, but I wanna just play, this is the opening bars of, of the famous uh, A Mes Amis from A Daughter of the Regiment. And uh, I just have to play for the audience just a little bit. A mes amis, quel jour de fête, je vais me chier sous votre amant. A mes amis, quel jour de fête, je vais me chier sous votre amant. L'amour qui m'a tourné la tête, désormais, désormais me ranéo. Oh, à quel moment? Oui, mes amis, je vais marcher sous votre amour, je vais marcher sous votre amour. Oui, c'est là pour qui je respire, à mes vœux à demi sourire. Et ce doux espoir de mon air trouble ma raison et mon cœur. Wow. 
<laughs> so I'll tell people if they want to hear the rest, they can they can go to the uh, Lyric Opera of Chicago website, and that is on there. I know I'm I, I can't I, you must I'm sorry to embarrass you, but <laughs> come on. But you see again, again as a tenor, I know that that B flat is harder than all the high C's in that in that uh, in that. Thank harder. you. <laughs> yes, and and it's a fabulous B flat, and so bravo you. Okay, now. Here is a very different side of Lawrence Brownlee, and I love this. I love the Tiny Desk Concerts of NPR. This is- Oh, yeah. Fun. Yeah, yeah. I just want to play a little bit of this. Thank you for that. Really beautiful and, and earnest singing and honest singing, which I, I love. Uh, and uh, and finally, I'm sure you know this this uh, clip. Yes, yes. Here we go. One, two, Okay, now I have to say, <clears throat> Larry, you have a lot of range, and and I don't mean just pitch. You have a lot of stylistic range as well, uh, and so uh, I love that. I love that that you can branch out in so many different directions. And uh, and how long have you been playing the bass? I want to know that. Well, you know, I picked up playing the bass. Oh gosh, I've been playing it for well. Okay, I started playing in church, but I didn't play the bass guitar. And the type of church that I was uh, born in, it was a church where we had a lot of instrumentation, but there's only room for one bass player. And so I had a cousin that was two years older than me and he played the bass. And I feel like that was my natural instrument that I would have played. But since he was playing it and he was really pretty much locked into that position, I didn't have the opportunity. And then when I went to undergrad, uh, because I had been in involved in gospel my whole life. That was actually my beginning. You know, I was involved with the gospel choir and they needed a bass player. So mm -hmm. I said, I can finally realize my desire. I had played other instruments. I played electric guitar and the drums and the trumpet, but I was like, I can finally realize my desire to be a bass player. And so I started playing there, but ended up playing actually semi-professional for a couple of choirs and a couple of groups. And I played a bunch through undergrad and grad school and then when I started singing close to 20 years ago, you know, when you're on the road all the time, you don't play. So I tell people that my fingers don't quite work like they used to, but every <laughs> now and again, I will pick it up at home and I will play a couple of things, but it's, it's my favorite instrument. I love playing the bass guitar. It's, uh, yeah. Well, you play quite well. I, I was like, I, you know, of course I saw you on the top box there on the screen and I, and then I was like, wait, he's playing bass too. <laughs> so, I love that. I just love that. You know, the whole thing, the whole concept behind that is because we were all sitting at home during COVID. And so all the people that I'm sure you probably recognize some of the other people. Oh, yeah. But it was the fantastic countertenor John Holiday was singing the top voice. Then I was singing in the middle voice. And then the bass, uh, Morris Robinson was singing the tenor part. And then you had Damien Sneed, pianist, composer, director. He was playing the, the organ and the piano. And then Solomon Howard, the bass, yeah. bass player. I mean, the bass singer was playing the percussion and then Morris Robinson was playing the drums. And so all of us, we had grown up 
with several traditions and we thought it would be funny because a lot of people know us as opera singers, but we actually had our roots in gospel. So for us to present a piece like that, uh, I thought it was a lot of fun for us to do and so many people enjoyed it, so it was great. Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah, it's a great chance for us to see that side of you. Um, <laughs> now that's a good segue to talk about your background. Tell us where you're from, uh, where you grew up and um, when you started singing, uh, singing seriously and, and, uh, and really starting to pursue that. I'm from Youngstown, Ohio, uh, very close to, uh, right between Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And so I grew up there, uh, one of six kids. My father was the church choir director. My mother was a solo student in the church. And so, yeah, we ha I had a very uh, strong musical influence and background. Uh, all of my siblings sang uh, to some degree, some like semi-professional, uh, I guess you can say. Uh, but uh, we had that great tradition of music in the house. You know, there was always music being made or played. So I grew up doing that. The funny thing is, as I said before, I played several instruments and I didn't like singing. So I was very shy, very, very shy about singing in the beginning. And uh, my mom said, you know, you have a great ear for music. And she said, sometimes I would be asleep, uh, asleep and I would be singing Christmas carols or something like that in my sleep. So music was inside of me. And I remember early on when my father would teach parts to the choir that sometimes, you know, we talk by, we say by ear or by rote, you know, and one of the things I remember my father was teaching a part wrong and I, I couldn't have been more than like nine years old. And I corrected my father because it just sounded wrong in my ear. I was like, that, that can't be right in front of the whole choir himself. So, uh, my dad said, you know what, you're right. That actually does sound like it's the right note. But uh, yeah, I was involved in music from elementary school. We had elementary school band and then in junior high school, I got in band and then choir. And so um, it was in high school that I became a little bit less shy about singing. I was involved in show choir and men's ensemble. And thankfully we had a very uh, active music program in our Youngstown City Schools, Youngstown, Ohio, my hometown. And so uh, I got a chance to, at the age of 15, that's the first time I ever traveled out of the country with our show choir. And so I knew that music could take you around the world. But I graduated from high school and I had been very, very involved in music in, in all aspects in high school. And um, when I got out of high school, I was trying to think about what I was going to do. And I decided I was going to try to be a lawyer, but I was taking music classes on the side and taking voice. And I remember doing a competition, uh, Nats, you know, everybody knows Nats. And so I did a Nats competition and I was in freshman men. And so um, I was fortunate to win. And then my teacher said, you don't need to be studying any law. You need to be a singer. And so, that's where I said, okay, maybe I'll think about being a singer seriously. And then the rest, I guess, changed. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Wow. That's, that's, that's quite a turnaround from, from, from uh, a lawyer. <laughs> thank, thank God you didn't go that way. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, so, so you said, um, you said that you started about, about 15, um, now, when was your big, what, when do you consider your big break? Now you won the national Met auditions, right? Yeah, so I won the national. I well, I did the Met auditions a few times. I did the Met audition when I was twenty-three. I did, did the auditions when I was twenty-four, and then I took a couple years off and I did it when I was twenty-seven. And I won it when I was twenty. It started in twenty-seven, and my birthday happened, and they did the finals. I was twenty-eight, and so I had had. Uh, I received the encouragement award both times when I was twenty-three and twenty-four. And so my big break was when I finally won. Um, actually, I was in the Seattle Young Artist Program. Oh, I was in the okay. Seattle Young Artist Program. And because I was in Seattle, I could compete in that division. So that's probably, you know, the same uh, division that, you know, anybody that's at Pacific is in that too. So it was the Western Division. So I was fortunate to win the districts and the regionals there. And then I went all the way across the country and then competed in the finals in New York City, and I was one of the winners. And so my big break came when I won the Met audition. I ended up getting an agent from that. I get, I ended up, you know, as a result of being in the finals of that, I had, you know, a recording of the Met audition where I was, you know, I had won and performed with the Met orchestra. So that was a very valuable piece of, you know, 
hardware at that time, hardware that you could use that was very helpful for me in the future for some future things that happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, yeah, you, you do go way back with Seattle Opera. Um, and that was in the Spade Jenkins era when he was, he was here. Uh, he, which yes. he, really, he really built Seattle Opera into, into what, it, what it became over the years. And so, um, so that's really cool that we have that local connection to you. Um, yeah. Now tell us about this crazy, this crazy time, this pandemic and everything. Um, you have really, I've been so impressed at your virtual presence and the things you're doing <laughs> online. And we talked about it uh, a little bit before the webinar began. Um, you know, your, I, I saw your interview with Denise Graves and, and I, I missed the one with, with Florence Quivar, but I'm going to look that up because because she's one of my favorite mezzos as well. Um, uh, I, I, and now my brain is filled with a performance I saw her sing of, uh, I think she was, she sang Eboli in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in Don Carlo. And I can remember her, her O oh, Don Fatale was just knocked you off your seat. And uh, yeah, she, <laughs> she, 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 man, what a singer. Um, but anyway, you have this series. Tell us about your virtual interviews uh, with, with singers. Um, and, and about your other uh, virtual and online uh, projects. Well, when the pandemic shut us down, you know, I'm, I'm known as a person who can't sit still, <laughs> you know, and I always have to be doing things. And so I decided to do something that I hope would be productive and helpful to people. A lot of younger singers reach out to me from time to time and people have asked me about, you know, advice or mentorship or other things. And so I decided that I would do something that would be beneficial to them. And so I decided that I would try to develop this series called The Sit Down with LB, basically where I would be able to talk to not only, you know, give advice to some of these singers, but use some of my great relationships of people over the years. And so I started with people like Angel Blue, who's a mm. phenom right now in the opera world, oh. uh, Janae Bridges, Will Liverman, Solomon Howard. These are all some of the really most income, up and coming singers of color. And so I, what I wanted to do is primarily target singers of color. So African-American singers or African born. And so I presented a lot of the younger singers in the beginning, but uh, I got a chance, well, I actually was reached out to by some of the uh, more seasoned or the veteran singers. And I reached out to some of them to see if they would be interested in, in coming onto the show. And so I've had George Shirley, I've had Vincent Cole, I've had, as you said, Denise Graves, Martina Arroyo. I've oh. had a pretty Pr Pr was on there. I've also had my gosh, I've had Harold Blackwell on wow. there. And most recently, Simon Estes, Roberta Alexander, Florence Quivar. And so they've all been so gracious to give up their of their time. And it's been really positively received. So I've been doing that. I've also been doing something called a coffee and a song which is where it's kind of like the idea of a Schubertian, where we come together and sing, uh, a couple of us sing pieces as if we're in the parlor after dinner. I love that idea. And whenever I just decide to retire from traveling as much as I do, I want to curate or develop that idea where it's more of a community sing-along, where mm -hmm. people sign up and we can have maybe one Thursday per month to bring music and really just be able to share. It doesn't have to be perfect, but this idea of cultivating this idea of sharing chamber music in this way, I think people did that more uh, in the past. And so I've been developing that and I have some, some irons in the fire about how that will go, but I wanted to do it virtually with some of my colleagues in Coffee and Assault. And lastly, I've been involved in a lot of uh, talks with um, different organizations that are, are talking about some of these social issues that we're dealing with today. Obviously with the pandemic, one of the most um, visible things that we know is things like the death of George Floyd, of course, Breonna Taylor, Amar, Amar Arbery, and so many other ones. And so many of the organizations have wanted to reach out to myself and some of my colleagues to be able to talk about equity, to talk about uh, implicit bias, discrimination. And so I've been taking part in some of these talks as well. So yes, I've been busy on social media, uh, but it's things that there are things that are very important to me. Uh, things that I want to speak to and lend my voice to. And so uh, as long as we're at home sitting around and not, you know, thankfully I'm, I'm beginning to, to do some things, some projects uh, as far as performing, but uh, I still 
have several things that I will be involved in the future to be able to lend my voice to some of these important issues. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I saw you have an album coming out soon, right? The Amici e Rivali. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Can you talk about that for a second? A little plug for your, your new release? I'm very, very excited about this album. And so a lot of people know that what I do is, the bulk of what I do is bel canto. I sing a lot of Rossini, Donizetti, and Bellini. And I remember a few years ago, I was asked to do a concert at the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam. And uh, they were very excited to do that uh, with me. And then they said, you know what? We'd love to pair you with someone else. Do you have any ideas? And so it came around that Michael Spires, the other American tenor that is a part of Amici and Rivali, uh, he and I decided to do this together. So we decided, why don't we, because he is a real uh, legitimate Barry tenor in the, you know, the, the same idea of a Andrea Nozzati, which is mm. famous, you know, he's a f famous singer who sang the roles that Rossini wrote for him and a person named Giovanni David. And it seems that my voice seems to be similar to Giovanni David and his to Andrea Nozzati. So in this concert that we did together in Amsterdam, they asked us if we um, could do some duets. And so we said, let's do the duets of Rossini's. Uh, a few of them. And so we programmed them. They were very positively received. And so we sang a whole concert and they, the audience was so enthusiastic. I said, well, let's sing the duet of Otello one more time. So when we came back for the encore to sing something we had already sung in the program, someone in the audience filmed it. Well, they filmed it and posted it maybe two days later. And that video went viral, like really, really, really viral. And it's funny because just, I think a year or two years earlier, I had done a video with Javier Camarena, who's also a good friend of mine at the Tupper Gala, the Richard Tupper Gala. And that video also went viral, like really like super viral. Right. So and so I decided after this concert with uh, Michael, I said, you know what? There may be an idea here. And so I went home and I did some research. Has there ever been a CD that's been made that encompasses or has together all of the great tenor, tenor duet and trio of Rossini? And there hadn't ever been. And wow. so I was like, let's do this. So I said to Michael, what do you think about this idea? He said, great. And so we got our resources together. We talked to Warner label, the, the classical record label and they were very enthusiastic. So we recorded it a year ago and it will be coming out November the 13th. So we're very, very excited about the great, I mean, there's incredible music on there, but uh, yes, very, very excited about that project. Fabulous. So well, I, I look forward to hearing the whole thing. I, of course, I saw the, the snippet from uh, Barbieri, which yes. is uh, <laughs> such a fun, Ali Dea di quel metallo, such a great duet. And, uh, and you both sounded fantastic on that. So I, I'm really looking forward to that release. Um, that's fantastic. Well, I tell you what, let's uh, let's bring on our mutual friend, Dr. Soon Cho. Uh, Soon, are you there? Hi. Good the to see you. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for including me in this conversation. I well, feel like I'm intruding in the tenor. Uh, you know. <laughs> Tenor no. love fest a little no, bit. No, no, we, we need we need special. some mezzo power. We need some mezzo power. We can do one. So. We can do one of these trios right now. Tenor, tenor, mezzo. There you go. Yeah. Yes. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But I so, have to say, you know, you guys don't fit the stereotypical tenor <laughs> image. Yeah. Well, I I feel like you you uh, both are just so creative and hardworking, intelligent, and, and Larry, you don't know this, but Jim has known to sing some journey tunes or two while oh, yeah. playing. Oh, really? Nice. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, when we, when this hit, the pandemic hit in the spring, we, we, uh, we started having a series of karaoke evenings with our students. And I said, nothing classical unless you really want to but you know otherwise just bring something fun and just sing you know and uh yeah it's been it's been a whole lot of fun we're gonna do some more of that this fall as well so who did um, dr show bring i again? didn't no, she needs I did to too. i know i know tell her exactly exactly oh, i'll sing a i'll learn a k-pop song and dance yeah. oh yes yes <laughs> absolutely 
I love it. Well, uh, soon I, you had a lot. I, I felt that you would have a lot to offer in this conversation, uh, and I'm really happy that, that I, I twisted your arm to join us. I know you, you, you wanted this to, to really be about Larry, and, and it is, of course, uh, and I, I wanted to spend at least the first half hour talking about, about all of his accomplishments, and, and we, but we obviously just barely scratched the surface of that. But, um, but let's dive in a little bit to a much more difficult subject, and that is the issue of, uh, of di the need for diversity in the opera world. Um, I, I would say systemic racism existing uh, in the world of opera. And, and I want to, I guess, clarify, first of all, what we're talking about when we say that. Um, because I think there, people have a knee-jerk reaction when they hear that. And, uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that, you know, are, that I think are sympathetic but still don't understand, you know? And, and there's, you know, they say, well, well, come on, I mean, we had a black president. And it's like, <laughs> okay, that's, that's really, um, yes, that's great, obviously, and uh, that's a great start, of course. But, but in the opera world, it's something that I've noticed, uh, well, throughout my training and throughout, uh, throughout my life, I, I have friends that are, I mean, fantastic, singers and they happen to be black and I know I, I mean I'm, th I'm thinking of someone right now in my mind who sang leading roles all over Europe and at the Met sing secondary roles all the time and you know I don't think that's a coincidence I really don't um, I'm sorry you know uh, but enough of me talking about it let, let me hear now that I've, I've opened that door uh, why don't why don't you all so, tell me how you feel about what I what I just said. Well, it's it's true uh, that there are a lot of people think because, as you mentioned, that we had a, a black president that we've come a long way. And we've made some progress. Obviously, uh, society has changed that I enjoy a life that's different than people my father's age who grew up in certain places you know, enjoy. My father grew up, grew up in the South, and there, even today, there are very, very strong remnants of how the South operated in the past. Mm -hmm. I realize that, again, my life is so much different in the fact that I can live where I live, and certain things that I do in my life, I don't see it. But I think some of the things that we've seen as of late and it, the things that we've been forced to see because of the pandemic, of course, namely the treatment of George Floyd and some of the other things. Uh, and even, you know, when you talk about the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, which we, you know, talked about uh, earlier in the program, they're filling a court right now, or they're trying to appoint a judge to take the seat. And if you think of the, the people that our president has put or nominated they're more of the same, you know? Uh, and these people are going to serve on the Supreme Court for 30 years, you know, their health, you know, hopefully if that agrees with them, you know, whatever your political, whatever your political leanings are, if those people stay healthy, they will be on the Supreme Court for many, many years. And so when all of these people, he's, he's appointed 198 judges and zero of them are black. So uh, I think one of them, maybe one or two of them are Asian and the rest of them are, I think out of 198, six of them are somewhat minority. And that is either women, Asians, or Indian American or Latino. So basically when people go up in front of the courts, they're gonna to have to face someone that is decidedly different than them, who has a different type of thinking, the people he is appointed. And so our country is going to go down a certain path, okay? so. The same thing can really be likened to, or you have the same effect in, effect in classical music and opera. If you have the people that are making the decisions, that control the decisions, that are controlling the programming and controlling the, the, um, the casting and controlling all these other things, it's more than likely that these people are going to operate in a certain way. If we don't diversify even the casting, the general, the, the administration, the artistic planning, all the places of power, you won't see this diversity and equity and representation of all the people 
that are in these cities, if you don't have these people in uh, positions of power, people who can really make changes. And so it is important that, as I said before, even the people on the board are diverse. When you think about how we market the opera and classical music to different people in the city, there has to be diversity also in that, you know, in that degree. You have to have, you have to, you have to make sure that all the people that are part of that city is somehow represented. And on, the only way you can do that is if you have diversity amongst the people in the office, in that institution, so you can make sure that you're looking out for the needs and the desires of all the people in that city. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well said. Soon, did you did you uh, from a woman's perspective, uh, what what do you what do you have to to say about about not only the 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 issue of racism because that's something you also have faced, I'm sure, uh, but also uh, also any kind of things you've experienced, misogyny or whatever, as, as a woman in the in the in the opera world or in the in the music business. Sure. Um, I was in preparation for this conversation. I was thinking back to the first time I felt marginalized for the things that I can't control. It was solo high school solo and ensemble contest. And the adjudicator, uh, after I sang, the adjudicator, who was happened to be a Caucasian lady, she said, wow, you have such a lovely moon-shaped face. And I was taken back because within the Korean community, I'm cons I don't have a moon-shaped face compared to my friends, but it was the first time that that was pointed out to me. And also she said, don't close your eyes because your eyes are already small and almond-shaped. And I was taken back because it was, you know, I didn't know how to respond. And then from that point on, you know, I still have that, the, that voice lingering in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so I make sure that when I go to auditions or in front of people that I, you know, shape my face so it's not so moon-like. <laughs> <laughs> Put some lashes on so my eyes are a little bit more, you know, you know, um, um, what is that? Visible, I, I suppose. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and also I talked to my um, best friend who is a very successful counter tenor in mostly in Europe. He's had a 20 year career and I asked him, you know, what his experience was and he made a really good point. He said that Asian women have it a little bit easier than the uh, male counterpart because as female, Asian female, I can put on the lashes, put on more makeup, put on a different color wig you know, corset on, padded a little bit, bit so I'm more uh, appealing to the Western audience. You're mm -hmm. right. Whereas as a guy, it's really hard to make an Asian guy look Western. And he shared with me that he's a counter tenor, so he sings mostly period operas, the Baroque. And he could count the, the times that he actually was hired to do a period opera. Most of the operas were uh, modernized or contemporary, so he didn't. He doesn't have to wear the period costumes, and I thought that was fascinating. That mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he wasn't hired for those roles in those productions. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, the aesthetic in Europe is is very different. I mean, the, that's it's more director driven and that's that's a widely discussed topic and sometimes not always for the better but um, we won't go there right now but um well i've been impressed with certain opera companies and how they are attempting to address <clears throat> the issues um well larry your your involvement with lyric opera of chicago i mean they they've really uh you know, I think done a nice job of putting that front and center. Uh, you're, well, the concert I played a clip of at the beginning, um, that's one example. Um, I've heard of other opera companies appointing artistic advisors to try and, uh, try and figure out how, <clears throat> how they can do better, how they can, uh, how they can get better at casting and, and more diversity. Uh, a friend of mine, Damian Jeter, wonderful uh, bass mm -hmm. baritone, uh, and, and Karen Slack are both uh, artistic advisors Port at Portland Opera. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, have you heard of other companies doing this? And I know 
I mean, I know you're involved in Philadelphia, but what, what other things are, yeah, tell us about what, what you know about this. Well, I serve as an artistic advisor at Opera Philadelphia, and part of my job is to deal with diversity expansion, community building, uh, opera, you know, community engagement, uh, being involved in the education process. And so they're very active as well. Uh, so you have Opera Philadelphia. I also do things with Houston Grand Opera, and they also have mobilized themselves and tried to do things. I had a there's a couple of things that I have been doing called Lawrence Brownlee and Friends. So I did one at Houston Grand Opera. They called it Giving Voice, but it's the same concept uh, that deals with diversity and you know, audience building and all the things I mentioned before. So Lyric Opera Chicago uh, is the same and a couple other uh, other entities as well. They've reached out to us and, you know, they've said, they reached out to me and said, you know what, uh, we didn't realize that these things were happening. And I, you know, I didn't say, where have you been? Have you been under a rock all, these, all this time? But I think this is also now the time for people to put their money where their mouths are. And I think for them to really not make this about being in solidarity right now, because I think allyship, <clears throat> excuse me, is very easy right now. It's easy in this time to say, oh, I'm in support of black singers. I'm support of Asian, sing Asian singers, or I'm support in, in support of you know, like LGBTQ singers or whatever, it's very easy to do that right now. But a lot of us are saying to them, make sure that there is some substance to what you're saying and you need to make um, noticeable changes like Portland has done by appointing people like Karen Slack. And Atlanta Opera has my good friend, Morris Robinson, he's you know, operating as an advisor. Eric Owens has been doing some work in different places. Ana Maria Martinez has been doing things. And so these people now are getting these positions where we can hold these organizations, we can hold their feet to the fire and say, look, it's not about you paying at lip service, but we want to see something that's meaningful, that is done to make sure the gains or the progress we want to see is actually happening. And I definitely talked to all the organizations that I've been involved with and said, I don't want to be just a figurehead or to have my name associated with a company without you really doing something. Because if you don't have a desire to make change, then find someone else. And so they've all promised to me that they want to see meaningful change and they are listening. So I'm happy to be doing some work with all these organizations. Yeah, we thank you for doing that work. And, um, you know, Opera is so much richer for it, for that diversity. I mean, you know, you think about Angel Blue or, or uh, Pretty Yende or, or some of these wonderful, uh, wonderful singers that, you know, and, I, you know, you look at the past. Okay, I was thinking about this. And I always think, okay, what do I say to the naysayers, you know? And just like they said, what, what about Barack Obama? Okay. Well, okay, well, what, ab what about Leontine Price? Okay, yeah, all right. What about George Shirley? Sure, Mr. Shirley sang at the Met and all that and had a great career. And, but the problem is, is not the exception to the rule, you know. Uh, these, these folks were, ex well, I just saw my friend Lemmy Pulliam has a, a wonderful uh, listen up with Lemmy. He has a wonderful yes. uh, interview uh, program that he's doing similar to, to yours. And he had Grace Bumbry on uh, yes yesterday or yeah I think it was Saturday yesterday. I think it was oh Saturday Saturday yeah yeah and, yeah, and I watched it and uh, I mean she, she was she was fantastic I thought she was yeah. great and, but you know you look at these star singers um, that that have have been notable examples but then you think but who have we not heard you know who have we not yeah. heard because the door had not been open to them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, it, the interesting thing is they just did Porgy and Bess at the Met. And so all the leads, Angel Blue was great, and Eric Owens was great, and you had uh, Latanya Moore, she was great, and you had, uh, gosh, Golda Schultz, Schultz yeah. she was great, and Alfred Walker. And, Alfred yeah. Walker was great. But did you hear the chorus? Mm. The chorus was unbelievable, and that chorus was full, full full to the, 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 the brim, just, just full to the absolute top with incredible talent of soloists, mm -hmm. not just course members, soloists 
who never had the opportunity to sing, not only at the Met, but we're talking about, you know, all of the companies that fall on every level of the companies in the United States, the Wacos and the Fort Worths and the Seattle Operas and the Washington National Operas and all these, everything in between, they're not on these stages. And so you see a few at the Met and you think, oh, these people are getting a chance. But when you go to the Nashvilles and you go to the Cincinnati Operas, you see all the same. And so this is where we're saying that it needs to happen at every level. And it shouldn't be an exception to the rule because all the incredible voices at that stage, we have plenty that every season of every company in the United States can be full with only black singers because the singers that you had on stage is only a small part of the incredibly you know, the in large amount of this, of singers of color that are out there, not only African-American, but also Asian. And I have so many of my friends, uh, some of my friends and colleagues who are incredibly talented and they don't get the opportunities as well. But again, it goes back to the top. If you don't have these people in positions of power that do the casting, you won't get the diversity that these, all of these companies can enjoy. And I think, as you said before, Jim, that, these seasons of these companies will be incredibly enriched. Enriched. If you bring, if you allow the stage to be, you know, full of people with this idea of colorblind casting, the best person, regardless of what they look like for the role, you know, there's no reason why Lemmy Pulliam shouldn't be singing all over the world. He's got one of the greatest voices that I've heard in the last 30 years. He's mm -hmm. an incredibly gifted singer but he isn't singing at the level he should be singing. And I, you know, I'm a big, I'm a good friend of Lemmy and I, and I have told him, I want to do everything I can. It shouldn't take me trying to help him because his talent should open the door for him itself. But again, who are the people that are making the decisions? And this is what we need to change. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, Lemmy's going to be on our series this fall. Actually, he's going to do a voice masterclass for us. Oh, great. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're excited to have him. And, uh, you know, I, I first became aware of Lemmy. Uh, <laughs> and I'll tell the story later when we when we have Lemmy, but it's a great example of what you're saying. You know, my wife went to college at Oberlin with Lemmy and and he had posted on social media. He had he had, he had sung the national anthem at a game somewhere. And she said, oh, you should sing, hear my friend, you know, he's, he sounds great. He's a national anthem. I was like, oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And so she yeah. played it and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and, and yeah, and I, I looked at, I looked him up and I was actually due to in the, in the, within a year and a half to direct a Pagliacci. And uh -huh. I immediately called him and I said, I said, have you ever have you sung Kanyo? And he said, Well, I've studied it. And I, you know, you can see me singing the aria. And I said, Well, I'm making a call. And we anyway, we, we brought him out to, to sing Kanyo. And he was fantastic. He was yeah. absolutely fantastic. So it's a great example of what you're talking about. Um, and you know, and, and he's, you know, he's, he's very entrepreneurial about his he's, he's pushing himself forward, which is good. But but I think we all and some I see someone in the chat, asked how do you strive to be equitable in the audition process is that reflected in how you how you screen resumes um it's a good question uh i mean i personally i i don't i i love to see uh singers of color in in a pile of resumes when, when we hear auditions for the companies with whom i work uh because I'm, I'm you know as a stage director or, or as in some cases conductor too um but uh, how to be equitable in the audition process. Singers can't be behind a screen like orchestra musicians can or, or instrumentalists can. So what are, what are the two of you, what do you have, uh, what do you think about that? That's a good question, Aaron, thank you. I think it's important to, um, like we all have biases, I have biases, I know that. And to recognize my biases and be aware and talk about it and make a conscious effort to minimize the impact of my bias. I find myself that um, when I'm teaching a student of color, that I teach that student differently. And it's not fair because I say, you need to be better. You need to work harder than your 
you know, a Caucasian counterpart. And it's not fair to the student because it's more work and it's harder. And I'm already setting up a very difficult life, you know, path. And as a new mother, and I have a, you know, I have a biracial kid, and I worry about my, my son. I don't want him to have a difficult life as a parent. Mm -hmm. I want him to have the same opportunities. I don't want it to be harder than someone else in the classroom. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. If it's funny, a lot of the people that are doing the casting, we we're talking about casting right now. A lot of people that are doing the casting are and this isn't a, this isn't an insult. It's just the truth, and this is something that I've heard from my friends who would say this. They're usually Caucasian gay men. No offense to anyone, because I mean, this is I'm not saying it, but they said themselves. The people that are in the room are Caucasian gay men, and so if you have these people that think a certain way, think that the offer should be this way think that it should be only beautiful looking people and depending upon their preferences of what they believe beautiful is, um, if they don't have a diverse group of friends sometimes that inform their lives and their decisions, then they're probably going to cast a certain way. You can cross the board. If you look at some of these seasons, they're hiring beautiful people and maybe not necessarily always the most talented people, but it's someone who looks the part and you know, sometimes they may feel like their hands are tied because their board wants the casting to look, to look a certain way as well. So what is the thing, what is the remedy to that? I think it is making sure that it's okay to have, you know, if it were one Caucasian gay guy and a heterosexual woman that was doing the casting or uh, some sense of a different viewpoint in the room Mm -hmm. that kind of says what is acceptable and what they want to see. And I think these people should be challenged. If I go to my friends and I have in a ton of my friends who are casting directors, you know, at various companies, and I can now, you know, that I'm an artist that I've been, you know, done a few things in the business, I can say to them, well, why the heck is it this way all the time? Mm -hmm. And for me to challenge them and to challenge their thinking, and to say to them, because I can, you know, I even recommend to some of them and say, well, many of them, and I'll say, you have to hear Lemmy. And you, and there's no, tell me the reason why, I can say to them, tell me the reason why he isn't singing X, Y, Z at your company. And if they say, oh, well, you know what? I'm not, and I'll say that's, I call foul because there's no reason. Because the most important thing in opera should be the voice. You know, it should be the voice. And so that's what I think it takes. I think it takes us challenging these people, challenging their thinking, and again, diversifying the people who get the chance to make these decisions. And someone should be able to say to them, look, you guys need, it starts with you guys, and you guys need to be bold enough to just do it and put them on stage and let them do the rest, because many of them do the rest when you get on stage and they knock the socks off all the people that are in the audience. That's right. That's right. I love uh, what you brought up about diversity in the casting room. I think that's so important and it kind of ties back in with our, our discussion about opera companies uh, having artistic advisors that can that can help them um, lead them in that direction. Uh, and that is the systemic part of systemic racism, right? I mean, so I think that's a pretty good explanation of it, uh, the way you just, you just broke that down, because uh, it's just built into the system, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I love the idea of, of that diversity in the casting room. That's a great point. Uh, we have, this, is a, this is a good question that segues nicely. Thank you, Glenn and Fritz, for this one. Do you prefer colorblind casting or casting in which minorities are specifically sought out? Okay, now I'm ready for this one. Okay, so. We have two examples, and uh, the, both of you know very well, and that is the example of Otello and the example of Madame Butterfly. And, and both of you will have a lot to say about those two operas. <laughs> now, Otello, mm -hmm. could, we could either be talking about the Verdi, uh, which, um, which, you know, which Lemmy has, has, has done in concert, uh, and I've heard it wonderfully, or the Rossini, which is in your repertoire, uh, and, and you know, 
you sing all over the place. So uh, the problem with Otello is that he's supposed to be black, right? So uh, companies, well, as, as we all know, and as we've seen, companies have put white singers on the stage in blackface singing Otello. And it's, it's horrifying. <laughs> it's really horrifying. So, yeah. so yeah. So for myself, Glenn, I would say uh, I would prefer colorblind casting. I, you want to cast a voice, you know, uh, and especially, especially if there's a black tenor who can sing Verdi's Otello, why in God's name would you hire a lesser voice for the role and then slap black makeup on them to do it? I, it blows my mind. It's, it's insane. Okay. Okay. Now discuss. <laughs> it's true. I remember when I first started, you know, being a young professional and, um, opera directors and you know casting directors said oh my gosh your your bread and butter role will be suzuki if suzuki <laughs> is you know japanese servant role and, and so it's a typecasting right yeah. and i just and looked at that role. it's a, good it's a role, great role absolutely but, yeah, right. and but it was i was pigeonholed just based right. on my ethnicity i went to you know i trained at the top conservatories i'm like you gotta be kidding me you're I got all these training to play a servant role, and by the no. way, Suzuki is is Japanese yeah. and you're Korean, so it's, right, you know, there is it's a true. distinction, right? But right. anyway, I mean, that's that's the that's the palette, the broad strokes that people are painting with. They're like, oh, you're Asian, you sing Suzuki, right? Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. 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 Larry, what do you think about the the Otello problem? You know, someone said to me before when I was a young artist at Seattle at um, Opera Theater St. Louis, they, I did a master class with Phyllis Curtin. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, I sang something and she said, it was funny. She was like, you know what? I don't have anything to say to you. I sang, the, I sang for her and she was like, um, do you have anything else? I don't have anything to say to you. And I was like, I sang something else. She was like, yeah, I don't have anything to say to you. Like she didn't give me any, you know, I was like, oh, thank you. I mean, it was a, nice thing that she said. I mean, I think she probably could have given me something, but uh, but she didn't say anything. So after that, there was someone in the audience who was very, very excited. And she said, oh my God. She was like, do you sing Otello? And I said, <laughs> no, I don't. It's not quite right for me. She was just like, you wouldn't have to wear makeup. Oh my oh God. Oh my goodness. I was like, okay. Well, I don't sing Verdi, so the Verdi Otello, but I sing a lot of Rossini. But actually, in the role, in the opera of Otello by Rossini, the role of Otello is not for me. It's more yeah, for right, a right. Nozzari type right. voice. And the role of Rodrigo, actually, is oh, a Rodrigo. role that's much better for me. So I actually was cast to sing this in Vienna. And I had the job, and then I got a call a few months later, and they said, uh, well, the stage director can't make this work because Otello has to be Black. And Rodrigo has to be right, so I don't mm. know. Uh, and so, you know, it's a hard thing because historically, how the opera was written, I think, if you look through the eyes of the time then, okay. But if you look through the eyes of the time now, if it was 2020, I think Rossini, or I, I like to think Rossini would think, I want the best person, the best voice to sing the role. The voice is the thing that should lead, and so if we can begin to be creative how to make these things work, I think we should. For me, I feel like if I have the voice to sing the role of Rodrigo and hopefully sing it uh, decently, I hope people would cast me to sing it because my voice is right for it. And I hope that I, I know that I can bring that character to life. So I should be able to sing it. Mm -hmm. If I can sing it, especially if I can sing it at a high level. But the fact that I am black, I hate the fact that it's gonna keep me from singing it, especially because you talked about Madam Butterfly, how many sopranos are actually 16 year old looking Asian women? Right. None. None. Ask them all the time. Yep. And it doesn't stop every company in the world from doing Madam Butterfly all the time. They mm -hmm. make exceptions for that, but they don't want to make an exception for soon to sing, uh, I don't know, Carmen or Isabella or Abley or something like that, Adalgisa, because she's Asian. Why does it work for someone 
to sing Cho Cho San, who weighs, no offense to them, who weighs 300 pounds and is from Romania. But she has the voice, but they make that exception, but they won't make the exception for someone else who, you know, it, it's, and this is the, where, we, this is what we need to change. Larry, do you think with the HD broadcast of opera performances that that had an impact, a further impact in casting pe singers of color? I think it's been helpful because okay. I've known people like, of course, these are all my good friends, Pretty Ende, who's been singing only leading roles from the Met and is broadcast all over the world. But she's singing leading roles in Covent Garden and Scala and everything else. Angel Blue is doing the same thing. I think people who are away from New York City if you go to New York City, it's normal to see diversity. You know, not that the Met always do it, does it, but you see some some diversity because they bring all international singers. But pumping these images to places throughout the world and let them, uh, giving them the opportunity to see Eric Owen singing, uh, you know, certain roles and uh, Solomon Howard and Janae Bridges, who's an incredible mezzo soprano, and some of these other singers singing roles that are not race specific, I think it does a good job to hopefully opening the minds of different ple you know, people in different places, especially if these singers are successful. I think it can be helpful and I think they need, and they know it too, I think they know it, that they need to do more. Uh, thankfully, I've gotten a chance to be on several of the HD broadcasts and I remember going to different places around the world and you know, I did a show, Chinarentula with Elena Garancha. And so she's rather tall. And, you know, over the years, people have said to me, oh, my gosh, I thought it was so cute you being on the top of that cake at the Met with Alina Garancha, who's this tall, and you're like this tall. And, uh, but people have seen me around the world, and they know that it is possible for a short black man to prince in Cinderella. And this is not just the most far-fetched idea, because hopefully the performance I gave made them believe that I could be serviceable, not even serviceable, but, but do a great job in that role. And then, yes, it's okay. Then it's not the first time they see it somewhere in the stages where they live. It's not like, oh my gosh, they're like, oh, I've seen it before. So it does a good job to put it out there. And the more you see something, the more normalized it becomes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say that, that Arturo that I mentioned that you sang in Seattle, I, I had no idea what your height was, Larry, and and uh, it, and no, really, I mean it, and it never occurred to me, because you you really did such a, a convincing hero on stage, uh, you were a hero on stage, and and one never thought, oh, well, isn't he a little short for that? I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, and so I will tell you that as an audience member, I I never had that thought, you know, uh, so that that's kind of funny that that has come up for you. Um, well, I mean, have you ever seen the movie, um, what was it, with Al Pacino, not Al Pacino, but um, Casino with Joe yes. Pesci? Yes. Yes, Joe Pesci. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe Pesci, or this one that he did a few years ago. Um, uh, she just did it a couple years ago. Uh, it's a very recent movie where he's a mob boss. And right. Joe Pesci, um, gosh, De Niro was in it. And yeah. he's old folks on Netflix or something or yeah, it's on Netflix. Gosh, what is the name of that movie? But anyway, somebody in the chat can tell us who it is. Yeah. But Joe Pesci is not very tall at all. Right. And he is one of the most terrifying people I've ever seen on screen because he can play the role so incredibly well. And I don't yes. think height necessarily ever has anything to do with intimidation factor or being able to live in a role that is meant for you. And so I had a stage director tell me a long time ago that you have to, Lawrence, Larry, you have to learn how to become the prince. You have to long, learn how to be a person of royalty, how you hold yourself so people believe it. And so I've worked very hard to hopefully be have, you know, have a presentable uh, appearance or stage department that people can say, even if they say in the beginning, yes, he's a short black man, by the end of the first act, they forget it and they stop thinking about a short black man on stage, but rather someone who is really playing this role. And so they take them through this, this suspension of disbelief and they're no longer thinking about a short black man, but just, oh my gosh, did you see Arturo? Not the short black Arturo, 
but just Arturo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, the way you sing it, that's all they're going to be thinking. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I I looked it up uh, just a second ago. It was the Irishman, I think. Yeah, the Irishman. Oh Man. yes. Yeah, Irish, yeah. 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 The, Pesci was great in that, wasn't oh, he? Amazing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And I think I'm taller than he is. Uh huh. Uh -huh. You're or taller than me, Larry. So you're really tall. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> i have a question larry as a black singer in a very eurocentric art form what were your personal experiences and challenges because right now you're an advocate for all the singers of color what mm -hmm. were what was your what were some personal experiences that you face and had to work through you know, it's it's funny because I remember meeting an agent and we were in France somewhere in Aix-en-Provence a few years ago and I was doing a show um, at the festival and this thing, this agent had come over and I got a chance to uh, go to a barbecue actually with him. And so as I was leaving to go away from this barbecue, I had a car I had rented and so this agent said to me, do you mind giving me a ride back into city? Because we were a little bit on the outskirts. And so going to this, uh, back into the city, we were talking, and this agent is American. So we were talking, we we're talking, and then he said to me, he said, do you mind if I tell you something? I said, sure. He said, I have to be honest with you. In the beginning of your career, I blocked you. I blocked you and I didn't think you had the talent. I worked against your best interest, I did. I'll admit it, mm. and I was wrong. I was wrong, that, and you have done so many wonderful things in this business, and I was absolutely dead wrong about you. But I want you to know now that I apologize for that. I am a big fan of yours, and I want nothing more than to see you succeed. So uh, what have I faced? I'm sure that some people even you know unbeknownst to me was working they, they were working against me they were trying to promote people that they liked more and this was a caucasian gay agent nothing i mean i don't want to start this idea that i'm think, saying anything negative about them because you know one of my very my very very closest friends and i hate, hate even saying this is a caucasian gay man who was who was a casting director or you know general director and uh but he told me I worked against you. So there were people who didn't want to see me succeed. There were people who didn't hire me, but thankfully the right people hired me and thankfully talent, you know, or what people perceived as my talent won in the end. And it'll open a lot of doors for me, uh, specifically in Europe. And so when I was making a name for myself in Europe, that began to open doors in the States as well. Spate Jenkins, who you mentioned earlier, he was one of my greatest advocates and supporters. He told me early on that he wanted to make me a leading man and he felt that I should be singing leading roles. And so Seattle Opera was very important to give me my first couple operas where I was singing, like you said, Arturo in Puritani, and I sang Cenerentola, and I sang Florence in the Amazons, and I sang Don Pasquale, and so many other things that they, you know, at a certain point, Spate was like, what do you want to sing? You can sing it at Seattle Opera. And what he did, he made people realize that this was a leading man that you're dealing with. And so he set a precedent. He set a fee scale. So it was just like, this is the amount of money he makes at Seattle Opera. So he should be making this amount of money in other places as, as well. So Space, Space, one of my most important uh, mentors and friends and someone who helped me out so much. Uh, but yes, I've, I know that I haven't been cast in various places because um, if you look at their rosters, there's never been a black person that has sung a leading role at these opera companies. And it has to be for a reason, because there are obviously singers out there who are talented enough to be singing these roles at that opera company, too. If you're going to have a career and you sing at La Scala and Covent Garden and Liceo and Madrid and Paris and Zurich and the Med and Chicago and San Francisco, why shouldn't you also sing at XYZ Company, too? And if you see that no one else is doing it, there ha it has to be for a reason. So I try to kind of be positive about the fact that I'm not going to sing on every stage of the world, but thankfully I've gotten the chance to sing on enough of them that if I don't sing on these stages, you know, I still can feel uh, fulfilled about 
the career that I made for myself to this point. Yeah, I'd say you, you have them pretty well covered, the stages. <laughs> so, uh, so let's talk about music. Um, let's talk about neglected music. Uh, we had a provost here at Pacific Lutheran University who uh, was a wonderful musicologist, Dr. Raylinda Brown, and she uh, she was really a passionate devotee of uh, and stud would study the music of uh, Florence Price, and she in fact just posthumously we lost her several years ago to cancer, but um, she she posthumously published a book on Florence Price and. Um, as part of uh, the memorial service for our our colleague, uh, actually soon sang a couple of songs of Florence Price, and I was like absolutely blown away. Not only by Soon's performance, but by this this song repertoire that was like some of the most gorgeous kind of post romantic song rep that I've ever heard, and and I had never heard it before. Soon, talk to us about learning that that music and and what what you experienced in that process. Absolutely, I had not heard of Florence Price until Dean Cameron Bennett um, asked me to look at the music and pick two songs, and and I was I had no idea this African American female composer even existed. And also just a prolific history of her works, not just for voice, but piano, chamber music. Mm -hmm. I was blown away because we were not taught uh, that or about her music in schools. It's not in our curriculum. Mm -hmm. And when I was preparing, I thought, why, why isn't her music more well known? What, what's going on in our education system that we were not exposed to her music. And we can change. I really believe that we can change the curriculum to be more inclusive, to expose our students who are our listeners, that they can you know, really do, be part of the change and it's necessary. And like for instance, um, like this semester, um, I've assigned all of my students music written by people of color. You know, like I'm consciously making the decision to do that. And you know, that's my part. And I think we can all do a little bit to make the change, be part of the change. Totally, yeah. I, I, I'm preparing to teach solo vocal literature next spring and you know, it's a survey class for undergrads, so I mean, they need to know about all the dead white guys' music. They need to know, they need to know Schubert's song. They need to know Poulenc. They need to know all of this wonderful music. But you know, I've I have to say, in the past, I have relegated the music of of, of neglected uh, people, like like women composers and. Uh, and, and also, uh, well, black composers. Um, I, I've really neglected that in the past. And, and obviously events of late have me really thinking, I need, I need a whole unit in the course on neglected uh, composers and, and say, look, I'm gonna throw, we're gonna listen to, and last time I taught the class, we listened to, to Florence Price you know, the African American Art Song Alliance is, has been great about um, making these materials uh, known, which when formerly they were just were not. They, I mean, at least in our training at, at the conservatory level. And I know there's that video going around about music theory being racist. I mean, I think absolutely and also you know the body of repertoire that we study is, is pretty racist. I mean, it's and it's systematic, you know. It is. <laughs> it is in the sense of, of course, but it goes along with the history of this country. And so uh, the things we're studying right now, the people who write the textbooks, the, the people who make the courses and design them, usually there's no diversity in those rooms as well. And so uh, when you begin to figure out that there's music by Florence Price and Udin, Udin Smith-Moore and Jackie Harrison, 
And of course, I mean, just there's a, a, a book of African American women composers for spirituals that I that I have, and I'm actually looking into that as well. Uh, Florence Price, as you mentioned before, uh, but beyond that, there's so many other people. And so when people, even the people that are programming um, works in chamber music and different organizations, they need to make sure that they diversify the repertoire as well to make sure that they're not always doing the same certain things. But to have, and not only, here's another thing that's important to not only program something only in Black History Month by a Black composer, because that also tends people to, to shy away from it. Because I think you can go and see that the attendance oftentimes falls off sometimes in Black History Month because they're presenting Black things. And not necessarily that people are anti that, but they didn't know it's like a certain thing that they're trying to do. But if you can program things in the rest of the year and make no differentiation, make sure that people feel like this work by a black composer is just as important as the new Jake Hagee piece or the new Bill, you know, William Bolton piece or whatever it is that a person like uh, Damien Sneed, who is a composer that I'm working with, or Tyshawn Sori, that their piece gets the same type of um, recognition and being put out front to some of these other pieces are, are, you know, definitely always presented, then I think that'll also help. But I think when people can go and do their own research and realize that there's an incredible amount of music out there by Black composers that's worthy that people should be programming, we just have to educate ourselves and be willing to go find it. Yeah, and, and educating yourself means taking a step back and realizing how uneducated you are about mm -hmm. it you know that's that was my experience personally speaking to step back and say well damn i've been neglecting all these great composers because i heard florence price's music and it was so eye-opening and i thought you know here she lived in really the early part of the 20th century so mm -hmm. we're, we're almost 100 years too late to, to, to give her credit, you know? Yeah. So, exactly. you know, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I don't know, I, I feel very, very passionate about it. And I'm really, I'm glad to, to hear you say what you said. Um, I guess that, that leads me to, to, my, to my final question, which is, what can we do as allies, you know, um, it, and allies in the music world, you know, we're soon and I are both uh, still performing a bit and also teaching quite a lot. And and you know, you're out there performing everywhere, and you have your your virtual um, platform uh, on which you can you know deliver your message. What can we do as allies to 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 help? It's funny because a lot of people have been talking about this word ally. Mm -hmm. And ally is a great word, but co-conspirator is a good word. Um, you know, uh, partner in good is a good <laughs> word to have. You know, people say partner in crime all the way, all the time, but partner in good. Uh, but I know, I mean, I've known Soon for a long time, and I'm not going to say how long because she'll think I'm trying to date her as far as like how old she is. I'm not going to say how old she is. Uh, but I've known her a long time. And I know Soon has an incredibly diverse group of friends. Uh, and when you think about, and I'm sure the same thing for you, you talk about your friendship with Lemmy and other people too. You got, you, you think of things in a way that you don't only think of yourself, but you think about your, your, your larger group of people that you associate with. And when you're programming and doing certain things, if you think about those people as well, because it is impossible for me to talk, to say, to not think about the fact that my world is so inclusive of, you know, so many different people. So it is not strange or foreign for me to think about an Asian person because I have very close friends, not just, you know, people that I'm just like friendly with. I have close friends that are Asian, that are gay, that are LGBTQ or, you know, transgender or, you know, from every socioeconomic, you know, level. I mean, I have just a diverse group of friends. And so I think 
in bigger terms because all of these people are under my umbrella. And so as you, the both of you are like organized, organizers and teachers and performers and other things as well, if we begin to think about our extended community and who will benefit or who will be helped in certain different things, in certain things, I think that could be helpful for, for everyone. And again, when we talk about this, we go back to this idea of making sure that the people are doing that are doing the casting are well versed or, you know, that they really invite people to the party. This idea of making sure that whatever city you're in, that all the people of that city is represented. Philadelphia has to do that. Chicago has to do that. Houston has to do that. Where you're at in the Pacific Lutheran, you know, the people of that city, everybody in that city should be represented. And so if we can have, you know, people that are mindful of who is a part of that community, I think that could be helpful for everybody in the, to be, you know, invited into the room and to have a viable place in whichever company or organization. Mm -hmm. That's great. Soon, did you have something to add to that? Agreed. I think open dialogue is key and represent representation is crucial because we all have biases that we may not be aware of ourselves and but if you have someone of you know from a different background there's check and balance and i think it's important for us to share our stories without the fear of judgment i think for me as an asian female i i don't feel comfortable voicing my feelings or my opinions because that's just not how i, I was raised or was you know, expected of me in my development. And so it's really difficult for me to, like even, you know, Dr. Brown, you had to pull my, twist my arm to come to this. I'm like, what, what? I have nothing to say, <laughs> you know? Oh, come on. Yeah. But I have to, you know, thank you so much. And I feel like at PLU that um, you and other, you know, colleagues really encourage me and support me and make it equitable knowing that, you know, that I have challenges voicing my opinions, that you know that I struggle and that you encourage, continue to encourage me and provide opportunities for me to stand on my own two feet and, you know, and, you know, and then I feel like um, I gain confidence and that I have something of value to share mm -hmm. with the community. And so I, I really thank you. Yeah, I think it's important for us to share our stories um, and to speak up, if we hear anyone say anything that's hurtful based on that, that lessens someone's value based on something they have no control over, we have to speak up mm -hmm. and not say, oh, that's how life is. Life is unfair. It's cruel. People are mean. We have to speak up and defend and be an advocate for those who have been hurt. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're, you're both such great examples uh, for your respective communities. Uh, Larry, I wanted to tell you a little story. I, we had a men's chorus symposium here at the university where a bunch of young men came from different high schools in the area. And uh, at a certain point in the day, we, we broke out into, into separate rooms by voice type. And so all the tenors came with me into a room and uh, in the room, there was a big screen. Uh, it, had, it was media, a kind of a media-friendly uh, room. Had a computer, internet, and and projector. And there were uh, quite a few African American young men in that in that group. And I looked around. And I I really hadn't thought about using the projector, but I was like, I'm just gonna play something for him. <laughs> and I <laughs> I queued up you singing Amez Ami, and those guys, their eyes lit up. They were, they, you know, they weren't familiar with opera, uh, but I, I think a lot of them left the room not only knowing about opera, but thinking maybe there's a place for me in this world, you know. Uh, and I, I really, I, they really struck me. And I, and and I, in preparing, thinking about this session we were going to have, I, I, I thought about that story. That's been about five, six years ago. I, don't, I can't remember when, but. Um, but I wanted to pass that on to you. And so, you know, you're, you're a great example. So, well, I think a lot of times if you see it, you can believe it. You know, I think a lot of people now believe that they can be, um, the president of the United States because Barack Obama won. I think people think they can be the vice president, you know, because 
Kamala Harris is now, you know, on the ticket. I think, you know, the fact that they're, you know, you know, people think they can be a voice teacher and singer because they see Soon Cho doing that. And, you know, they just, when they see it, they can believe it. A lot of people want to play tennis now because of the Williams sisters. A lot of people want to play golf because of Tiger Woods or Michelle Wee. You know, I mean, it's just you, a lot of people don't have the access or the knowledge that certain things exist. And so anything you see, you can believe. And so as we continue to, you know, make strides and, you know, blaze, tra you know, blaze trailways or just, you know, get into these houses and these opportunities uh, in, these, in these positions that people can begin to believe it because the opportunity for us to do and to arrive at these places, if that's there, I think a lot of people will be inspired to pursue these, uh, these professions or these dreams because they believe, they know it's possible because they see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Soon, did you, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Speaking of Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. that moment when she accepted the nomination as VP <laughs> of the Democratic Party, I had a visceral emotional response. I wept and I had no idea the power of representation until then. I mean, I knew, you know, role models are important, but just to see a woman of color of you know, black and Asian descent and the Asian mix in it. Cause you know, when I think about Asians, I think about for me, Korean, like K-pop and Psy and mm -hmm. now Parasite the movie and, you know, m more um, popular culture, but at a political platform, I, I lost it. I cried all night and cause, cause I was so happy. Mm -hmm. And just seeing that that moment gave me strength. It's like, okay, my voice does matter. It was really powerful for me. And so I thought, wow, I bet my students who are of color see me and they feel supported and they feel like they can do something that I've done. So it made a really, really powerful uh, positive impact. And it really has motivated me to do things proactively rather than being a bystander. That's why I reached out to you, Larry. I was like, Larry, you gotta come. <laughs> the, our POU students have to see you and hear you talk. Yeah, <laughs> thank you yeah. so much. We can't thank you enough. Well, really well, you know, it's, I, I'm happy to lend my voice and talk to, to young, young singers and young students. Uh, some people did it for me. You know, some people uh, made themselves available that I could learn. And I feel like it's all about paying it forward. So Happy to be there, happy to be here rather, and to share with the students and to spend time with both of you. And, uh, same. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, yeah. Opa. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was, it was really our pleasure, and we do so appreciate it. And I know it's getting late there on the East Coast for you, so, uh, we'll, we'll probably not, you're used to late performances, but, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, I'll watch the rest of the Monday night football game when I get up here. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, go Saints. I'm I'm from Louisiana, so I'm a I'm Saints a big, fan. I'm a big football fan. Big, Are big, you? huge football. Big, fan. and that's big. A, yeah, she knows. Uh, huge fantasy football fan, and you know I'm trying to deal with all the injuries that happened this weekend. Oh, oh my gosh, so terrible! Many. I know. Poor 49ers, right? Yeah, 49ers, the Denver Broncos, the New York Giants. Yeah, well, the 49ers, they had about four people. That went out, right. and, you know. Nick Bosa went out, and Garoppolo right. went out, and Mostert is out, and my good lord! Uh, I and know. Saquon Barkley for the Giants was my running back that I had in the first round. He's gone. Portland oh, sucks. No. Denver Broncos, and so <laughs> I'll be searching the way, scouring the waiver wire to see if I can pick up some people. But uh, no, it's not too late for me. So, but no, it was okay. not. Okay. Again, like I said, yeah, McCaffrey. McCaffrey is yeah. He's out for like four to six weeks, I think, and so it's. Oh yeah, my <laughs> my my student Josh, my former student Josh, who is studying at Eastman, a wonderful young tenor. He said he had McCaffrey as well. He feels for you. <laughs> oh yeah, McCaffrey's out. Uh, Cam Newton, I I have Cam Newton in one of my leagues. Uh, I have him, and I think he's, he's actually going to do pretty good. So there's a lot of guys. Like I said, you just have to be smart because you have waiver wire. I mean, everybody knows that fantasy football championships, and I actually have a few of them under my belt. They're not one on the draft. It's the waiver wire 
and just kind of like picking up some of these guys that emerge throughout the season. So I'll be doing some digging to see if I can sound <laughs> my fantasy football season but uh yeah yeah well i think cam's gonna be good for you i mean last night he had he had us really worried in seattle so <laughs> it was good and the thing is you know but he was pretty much injured all last year and i think he's coming back this year and it was a hostile environment and russell wilson just played outside of his mind last night uh had that been someone else who didn't throw five touchdowns like russell right. Wilson did last night I think the Patriots would have won. But I think it's going to be a good season for Cam. And so I'm happy oh, yeah. to have him in two of my leagues. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, good. All right. Well, good luck to you with the rest of the season and, uh, and, and, the, rest of, and, and the rest of the music season as well. I hope things open up soon. And uh, I know yeah. that, you know, Europe's opening up. So, so are you going to get over there and sing? Well, I have some things planned, actually, on October the 9th. I'm supposed to be going to Munich for about a week and then going to Moscow, Russia. And then Palermo, Italy. So uh, if these things don't fall through, you know, everything's changing all the time. And the goal, po the goal post is being moved further back. And, you know, certain things like quarantines and people trying to, like, postpone things uh, here and there. I have to figure out how that stuff works. But, uh, yeah, I do plan to be over there pretty soon. And I'm ready to get back to being on the stage like, you know, a better version of what it was in the past. Yeah. Well, we can't wait to see you on stage again. And. Thank you so much, Larry Brownlee, for joining us tonight and having a really great conversation. We really appreciate it. And, and soon, thank you for co-hosting. I really appreciate it. Thank you for including me. It was great to see you both. <laughs> I good know. To I miss you from far away. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see. I'll see you soon. Soon. But I, she has an office <laughs> right next to me. Uh, so uh, one of these days, we'll actually be back over here. So yeah. Yes. Well, be Larry, well. Thanks so much. Everyone. Thank you. Thank Have a good you. Night. Thank good night. You. Thank you.